Now the next question is by uh, a lady, Sito. Uh, what's your vision, uh, vision on the women's division? Um, do you think it's going to be in the right direction at the moment? Do I think the women's division is going in the right direction? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's you know, it's it's probably it may be the hottest uh, part of the WWE product today. You know, so uh, and then we have some amazing, amazing uh, female athletes in the WWE right now. Oh gosh, I, you know, of course I, I really am missing Becky Lynch. I'll be glad when she comes back. But I mean, you know, Charlotte Flair, uh, Bailey. Uh, Sasha Banks, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll never be able to sit here and go down the whole list. But I mean, just some amazing female talent, and and uh, their matches. I, I, you know, I like to, I do like to think back during the Attitude Era when we referred to them as, uh, you know, these sexy divas and beautiful young ladies and that sort of thing. Now it's, you know, it's, uh, it's this whole movement has been about empowering women, and we look at the we look at the females now as as just, uh, I mean, some major awesome athletes, and they're doing such a great job. And uh, you know, you can't you can't uh, not be happy with the way it's with the way it's going. All right. So our next question is for from Adam Adam McBury, and he asked, of course, you are a as pro wrestler, you travel all over the world, all over the the, the, the planet. What's your craziest road story? What, what is my what now? The craziest on the road story. Oh gosh. Oh man, I'm, like like I said, I've been traveling in this business for 50 years, and then and out of those 50 years, it's almost traveling every single day of the week for 50 years. So, I mean, I I. I I can't even begin to tell or pick out one that would be the, the craziest. I guess if I had to pick out one and you guys can go uh, somewhere and kind of look it up and Google it, and you'll hear stories about it. But I would have to say my craziest trip or road story would have been what what became known as the flight from hell. And that was when the WWE chartered a plane. We went overseas and it everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Michael Cole, or Michael uh, Michael Hayes, P.S. Michael Hayes, got his long hair that he had had for years and years and years. Somebody snipped it off while he was asleep. Uh, there was a fight between, I think, Kurt May it was Brock Lesnar, Kurt Angle. I'm not sure who, but these guys are fighting on the plane in midair and slamming up against the exit door and stuff. The pilot had to threaten to uh, land the plane. Uh, just so many crazy things. Ric Flair. Uh, I, I see, I can't even tell the whole story, but somehow uh, the story goes that Ric Flair was doing the strut down the aisle wearing nothing but his wrestling robe. So it was, some, it was the flight from hell. Look it up. You'll, you'll, you'll be interested in that. Right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, question for me, from me. Um, you're traveling around the world. Um, is there a country or a city that you uh, fall in love with? Oh man, I, I, there is there is one place that I went that, uh, I, and I, I don't know. I, I, I love Japan, uh, but there there was some you know with the language barrier that was a little difficult. But I really enjoyed being over there. The people were so nice; it was awesome. Um, the, the only drawback with that was the language because I went the first time I went over and was wrestling there. I jumped off the top rope out onto the floor to double chop somebody and i i thought i broke my foot or my heel and i it just had a major stone bruise on it and trying to go to like a pharmacy or something and trying to explain what i had done and and what i need what kind of medicine or something i was actually looking for some epsom salts that i could soak my foot in i wound up having to try to draw a picture i drew a picture of my foot and like a rock hitting my foot and some pain arrows going out of it so Uh, but I couldn't make them understand, so that was difficult, the language barrier there. But the one country I went to that I just I thought was awesome, and I've said many times, if I couldn't live here in the United States, I would like to live there, and that was Australia. I loved Australia. Sydney, Australia, beautiful. Um, I, I, it was uh, just uh, an awesome trip over there. I was over there for like 
eight days, and uh, it, it was it was fabulous. Wow, nice. That's here. I hear Australia. It's amazing for everybody, but I'm afraid for the, for those animals. <laughs> uh, the next you know, one. I, the, only, the only problem I had with uh, Australia over there, like I said, it was over there for eight days, and not once, never one time, did I see a kangaroo. Yeah, I thought they were going to be hopping all over the place out in front of the car. And didn't even see one. Oh wow. All right, the next question is from uh, Frederick, and he asks you, uh, normally when you uh, get into the ring, you feel the chemistry, you feel the magic with some opponents, and with some guys you totally don't have that chemistry or totally don't have the magic. With which uh, wrestlers did you have an amazing chemistry, and which ones or did you think, well, uh, they didn't really feel good? Yeah, and uh, there, were, there were several guys, a lot of guys that... Uh, that I had really good chemistry with uh, one guy that probably maybe probably the best. And we, we actually wrestled each other. We sat down and, and, and figured it out one time. We actually wrestled each other over 500 times each other during our career. And that was Bill superstar Dundee. And he was in the Memphis territory and still is around. Uh, but um, other than Bill, uh, tremendous chemistry with Nick Bockwinkle. He was tremendous. Uh, but I think probably if I had to, uh, I mean, there's so many guys that I work well with. I mean, up in the WWE, Brett, the Hitman Hart. Oh my gosh. Our matches, uh, I thought were fabulous. Um, but the one guy that I always enjoyed working with, even though he beat the hell out of you, I'd still enjoyed working with because I was such a fan of his was Terry Funk. Oh, wow. Terry I Funk. Terry Funk to this day. Uh, you, of course, are a phenomenal commentator. You've you've been the voice for WWE over so many years. And, and every iconic moment on whatever social media, you hear that iconic scream. Now, of course, the commentators are uh, different, different people. Maybe different type of commentary as well. What's your vision on the commentary right now in pro wrestling and in, in WWE uh, and as main focus? Well, um you know, I like every single one. I know every one of the uh, commentators right now uh, on a, you know, on a personal friendly basis and everything. Love Michael Cole, uh, Corey Graves. I haven't been around as much as I would like to, uh, but the, you know, all the guys, all the guys that are on raw right now, I love all of those guys, but I, it's something about when I watch the commentary or listen to the commentary now, and this is just my opinion now. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this is just what I think. I, I honestly, I think they take it too serious. Uh, my idea, I would like to come back on the raw table and say, hey, I'm going to make wrestling fun again. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I always enjoyed, uh, because let's face it, it's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. So, you know, it's entertainment. Let's go out there and, and, and I think that um, I, I think one of the problems is that like when JR uh, was my partner, me and JR or me and Michael Cole, especially Michael Cole because uh, and, and JR too, because we were we were uh, considered stars on the same level as the wrestling superstars. And I think when 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 you uh, when the fans at home, were listening to the commentators and they felt like they were big stars as well. They, they paid more attention to what they said. And uh, we, because, you know, we, JR and I, we had matches against guys and me and Michael Cole had a match against each other at WrestleMania. We were on the same level as the, uh, as the other superstars. And I think now I don't think in the, I, ju I just don't think because I think because of the commentary, the, the announcers or the commentators are not looked at, at at that same level. And because of that, I think the fans don't, they don't, uh, I don't know. I don't think they relate to what these guys are saying like they would if it was, you know, if, if you're listening to John Cena tell you something, or if you're listening to The Rock tell you something, uh, you're going to listen and you're going to uh, pay attention more so than if you're listening to some guy that you don't even you know, it's just a talking head who you don't even know their name. And I think that's the difference now. I don't think they allow the commentators 
the leeway or the freeway to be to be stars themselves, but they should be because they're you know they're they're on they're on the show more than any of the uh, and more than any of the wrestlers. You know they're on from the beginning to the end, and the wrestlers come out and maybe have a ten minute segment each. But uh, I just think they should let the commentators be more uh, more of uh, stars than they are today. Okay, um, the last question. Yay, the last question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sent in by Cherry. Uh, he wants to know, you are a big Coca-Cola fan. You have a unique collection of Coca-Cola items and memorabilia. Um, he wants to know, when did the love start for the brand? And what's the most unique item you have in your collection of the Coca-Cola brands? Well, I fell in love with the Coca-Cola brand because of... Uh, uh, because of my artwork, a lot of people don't realize, but I'm an artist. That's the way I got into wrestling, by drawing and painting pictures of wrestlers. All through school, I majored in art, won a full tuition commercial art scholarship to the University of Memphis when I graduated. And um, I, I had I had certain artists that I was a fan of their work. Norman Rockwell was a, was a major influence on me. But there was, a, there was an artist named Haddon Sunbloom. Haddon Sunbloom, look him up. He's the artist that worked for Coca-Cola and painted uh, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. He painted so many of their uh, advertising art. Uh, but the main thing that he was famous for was, you know, every year there would be a Coca-Cola Santa Claus picture, a Christmas picture that featured Coca-Cola and Santa Claus that would come out every year in their, in their advertising. And this guy did all of those paintings. I was a big fan of his. One day... Uh, one day I was in, up in Philadelphia and I'm happened to walk in, I'm walking down the street and I see, I'm getting phone calls. I'm, I think it's Vince McMahon's, get off there. But uh, anyway, I'm walking down the street and I see this antique store. And in the window of this antique store is a old calendar page from 1949. And the artwork on it was done by this artist. It was actually a picture of a, a girl drinking a, a bottle of Coke, and and um, but it was by that artist, Haddon Sunbloom. And I just looked at that and I said, man, that's a beautiful piece of art. That's a great calendar. And then all of a sudden I looked down and the calendar was from the month and the date that I was born. So I thought, wow, this is meant to be. So I went in and I bought this, I bought this piece. It's like this big. I took it home and that was my very first uh, piece of Coca-Cola memorabilia that I purchased. And since then, it just, it, it developed a life of its own. I had to actually move from one house to another because my, my, Co my Coca-Cola collection got so big. I got, I own seven full size Coca-Cola machines now, big, uh, neon signs, uh, just so much stuff. It's, uh, I, I look at it every day and I go, I gotta, I gotta do something with this stuff, but yeah, I'd love the collecting the Coke memorabilia. Uh, we're gonna thank you for your time because I got a message that you need to go yeah. and it was only 10 oh. minutes, so sorry. Yeah. They just opened the door to the men's room, so I better get out of here. Right, thank you very much, uh, Jerry the King Lawler, and we wish you the, okay. a very I'm gonna leave you guys with the words that I had Muhammad Ali on my show one time. And uh, when the show was over, he said this to me. He said, I love your show and I like your style. But your pay is so cheap. Don't call me for a while. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. Thank nice you very day. much, Jerry. Bye-bye. See you guys.